This presentation is generally an introduction to college applications, the timeline, tips, strategies, and suggestions that I would give to any students that are about to start the process. And in the midst of all of these slides, I give information about a certain topic, and then I also talk about how I approach the activity section. And obviously not all of you are current sophomores or juniors in high school, so not all of this is fully applicable, but it does help, I think, to have an idea of what college applications are going to look like and how to present yourself to the best of your ability so that you can hopefully get into your dream school. So this is a little bit of information about me, but this is kind of the profile that I was applying to college with. So my biggest selling point or spike, as um, college application officers call it, is um, my NASA internships. I was a six-time NASA research intern, and I'll just go through each of my opportunities briefly. NASA SEAS was hosted at UT Austin, and that was over the summer. And that following fall, the fall of my junior year, I was a research analyst at Johnson Space Center. And then during my junior year, I was in NASA High School Aerospace Scholars, and I also participated in Moonshot as a manager. Throughout my junior year, I also was a peer engagement intern, and I was an intern at NASA headquarters in the astrophysics division. And I think out of all of these internships, it was definitely my headquarters position in the astrophysics division specifically that probably boosted my application the most. That was the most um, real world scientific experience that I had on my resume. It really appealed to admissions officers because I received a lot of letters back from them. Um, letters from my admissions file. If you're admitted, a lot of colleges like to send reasons why you were admitted. And a lot of them really emphasized that they hadn't seen a high schooler that had such exposure to both academia and industry research. So my NASA internships definitely helped with that. Another big spike on my application was definitely my research groups. Throughout high school, I was in three research groups, the Harvard Heller group, the MIT Herring group, and CERN Beamline, which is a competition, but it was hosted in conjunction with the University of Texas. I also participated in a lot of independent research, and I actually published several of them as well. And I was able to include my um, papers, attach them as supplemental materials on my application. So admissions officers were actually able to read through my papers and see what the research I had done, what it consisted of. I also had a lot of extracurriculars dedicated towards community service, educational equity work emboldening underserved students in STEM. So obviously I am the director of Space Time Archives and TAS and Team TAS were also a large part of my application. I'm a director at large at the Overhead TAS organization and I'm the president of Team TAS and I also included that I was the vice president in my junior year. And even more than that, I interned at the Dallas Museum of Art for two years. So I also included that position. So this is the general timeline of how we're going to go through this presentation. So first, I'm going to talk about how to form your college list and what factors to keep in mind when you're narrowing down the schools you're applying to. And then I will discuss scores, GPA, class rank, all of the academics, statistics that set up your profile as an applicant. And I'm also going to discuss extracurriculars, what extracurriculars I did, what advice I would have for people that are following the same rigorous STEM, astrophysics, physics, engineering routes. And essays, essays are, I would think, one of the largest parts of your application just because of how, how they're kind of a window to you as a person. All the admissions officers know about you until they read your essays is who you are on paper what your GPA is, what internships you've been a part of. And that doesn't really tell them about your character or your personality or your history, your passions. So essays are definitely a great outlet for that. And then finally, once you went through this entire process, submitted your applications and received decisions back, how do you choose a college? So first, let's start with building your college list. So I think there's basically three components to this question. The first step is building the giant list that basically has every school that you could ever be interested in. And there's certain factors to keep in mind when you're building this list of 20 to 30 schools. You can keep in mind factors like weather, climate, the academic capacity, the research capacity, how prestigious or selective a school is. Those are just some of the factors that I thought about. And it's also very important to make sure that you have large diversity in the types of schools and the selectivity of those schools. So that means your 30 to 20 schools, that should be a healthy mix of safety schools, which are schools that you're likely to get into, target schools, 
which are hit or miss, and then reach schools where it's kind of a reach for you to get in there, as in your SAT or GPA is a bit lower than their usual admitted profile. So when you're deciding what's a safety, what's a target, and what's a reach, I would highly recommend that you look at your standardized testing scores, you look at your GPA, you look at profiles of students that have been admitted, and see, am I do I have a better profile than them? Is my profile basically on par with them? Or is mine just like nowhere close to where theirs are? So once you have this giant list, you definitely have to narrow it down. And most people advise you to have eight to 15 schools on your final list of the schools you apply to. I actually applied to 20. I really wanted myself to have a lot of options when March and April came and I was deciding on which school I would go to. So I did apply to 20. I don't have regrets about that choice. I think if maybe the application fees were a concern because it's around 90 to to $100 per school, if that financial burden is a concern, then I would definitely cut it down maybe to eight to 15. But honestly, I just wanted to weigh my options and just have the best pool available for me when I did pick my school. But I would caution students on applying to like, 25 or 30 schools, because I do know many, many people that did that. And usually what happens when you're, when you're spending that much time on so many applications is that the quality of each individual application pretty much reduces. So I think a good balance is 10 to 20. And also if you're applying to a lot of T20s, which means top 20 schools, then most people find themselves around 20 schools or around 15 schools. And I also, I already briefly discussed this, but in terms of the factors you should consider when you're picking which colleges to apply to, you should definitely, definitely make sure you're looking at their financial aid and how generous they are in terms of the monetary grants that they give you to go to that college. A lot of schools have really, really hefty scholarships. When you look at the Ivies, they, their applicants and their applicant pool on their admitted class, those are the best of the best. It's a self-selecting applicant pool. So Pretty much everyone there is deserving of a merit scholarship. So Ivies will be less receptive to giving merit scholarships because it's like, how do I choose between all these students that are equally as intelligent and passionate? I would consider a lot of factors beyond just academics and research labs and professors. I would also look at student life. A lot of seniors, when they're applying for college, they're, they know they're going to join Greek life or they know they're going to join certain clubs or certain activities. Let's say you really wanted to join a rocket team and a certain school didn't offer that team and it was really hard to create a new club at that school. Then you might be more inclined to go to a different university that has a really, really competitive rocket team. So this is just a brief overview of the different application cycles that consist of college admissions. So there, it gets a little confusing, but there are five in total, and I only used three of them. I did not use any binding or restrictive programs, which you see on the right, early decision and restrictive early action. I applied regular decision to most of my schools, a few rolling and a few EA. And I'll talk about those more on the next slide. But regular decision applications are usually the most common. Um, these are the ones that are due on January 1st. There's a stated decision date that's probably around March or April. And most schools follow this format, but there are some state schools and I think also a few private schools that offer rolling admission. The University of Texas is one. So for example, if you apply to UT by November 1st, you're going to get a decision earlier than those that apply in December. So rolling admission, it's definitely for those that wanna be proactive with their applications and receive decisions back faster. Early action is when you submit your applications by November 1st, and then you hear back in around mid-December. And this is basically giving you an idea and a sense of security and for where you could potentially go to college. Because if you were rejected from all your EA schools, then you know to put in more effort on your regular decision schools. And if you did get into your dream school EA, then you kind of feel a little bit of comfort knowing that you have a safeguard behind you. And if everything else fails in regular decision, you have something to fall back on. So early decision and restrictive early action are the two application cycles that become a little bit complicated. Early decision is a binding commitment to attend a school. And schools that do early decision include Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, Cornell, 
Dartmouth. Those are the ones I can name off the top of my head, but those are all Ivies. And restrictive early action is schools like Harvard, Stanford, um, Princeton. I believe Columbia is early decision, but basically a lot of T20s or top schools, they either offer early decision or restrictive early action. Schools like UNC Chapel Hill, Georgia Tech, University of Michigan, MIT, U Chicago, they all offer early action. And it really depends on which pathway is the best for you. If you know that if you get into a school, you're going to attend that school, then early decision is probably the best for you. But also students have to weigh lots of financial aid offers and they don't feel comfortable with committing to a school that early. And those applicants will choose to go with restrictive early or early action. And just to briefly touch on what restrictive early action consists of, restrictive means that you're only applying to one school early action, while the regular early action program allows you to apply to however many schools early action as you would like. So this is the first introduction to my perspective. These are the choices and the pathways I took when I was choosing my college list and applying to colleges. I applied to 20 schools, like I mentioned. That number consisted of two safeties, four targets, and 14 reaches. And this is a pretty high reach number, but the two safeties and four targets is probably what you should aim for. And the 14 reaches were just me trying to see where I could potentially end up and what could be the best school that I could get into. So the two safeties that I chose were CU Boulder and UW, University of Washington, Seattle. And these are both great physics schools, great engineering schools, and they do have higher acceptance rates. I would say that if you are a competitive applicant and you know that you rank well comparatively, then I would say that anything 40% or higher could be a safety, but obviously that percentage would differ based on the student that's applying, what their profile is, where they're applying from. In terms of the targets that I applied to, I applied to UC Santa Barbara, University of Michigan, UT Austin, and Georgia Tech. And you can see the acceptance rates in parentheses right next to the college name. And I would say that target acceptance rates, again, if you're a competitive applicant and you are confident in your application, I would say that that, that number ranges anywhere from 15 to 30% for a target. But also if you have a lower GPA or a lower SAT score, then your target um, acceptance rate range is going to be different. My reaches were obviously 14 a lot. I applied to Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, MIT, Yale, Columbia, and you can read the rest, but these ranged from 2.7% to 11.3%. So 11.3 corresponded with UC Berkeley, so that was the high end of my reaches, and Caltech was 2.7%, so that was the low end. So I briefly touched on the application cycles I used, but I'll go more into depth right now. I did early action for UT Austin, MIT, and UChicago. So I heard back from MIT and UChicago in mid-December and UT Austin was early action rolling. So they called it a priority admission. So I heard back from them, I believe at the end of January. When I explained my college list to people and where I applied and why I applied during a specific application cycle, they often ask if I have any regrets, if there's anything I would do differently if I were to do it all over again. And I think that everything worked out for me in the end. I was a bit naive when I was applying. I did not know as much as I should have about acceptance rates and how acceptance rates differ based on if you're applying early or whether you're applying regular. So if I were to do it all over again, I would have early action in Mich Michigan along with my three early action schools because I didn't even know that the University of Michigan offered early action. So that was an opportunity for me to have done more research that I didn't do. And if I had not done that early action option, I would have only restrictive early action Princeton or Harvard. And I also do want to touch on how acceptance rates differ based on when you apply. For example, I believe Princeton's early action, restrictive early action acceptance rate is around six, seven or eight percent, but their regular decision acceptance rate is around three or four percent. So there's a very large discrepancy between those two ranges. And one of the reasons for that is because early action schools are more self-selecting. So that means the people that are in that applicant pool are generally stronger, more competitive applicants. So therefore the acceptance rate for that pool is going to be higher. Princeton is going to want to take more of those competitive applicants. So next I will be touching on test scores, GPA and class rank. So these are the more cut and dry parts of your application. 
you are able to take your SAT as many times as you want. So it's not just a one and done type of situation, but it is important to remember what range you want to fall in and how you would rank against other applicants. So in terms of testing for the SAT, let's say you're aiming for a T10 university and you want to be above average in their applicant pool. I would strongly, strongly suggest aiming for a 1550 to a 1600 super score. And if you aren't familiar with the term super score, the SAT is split into two sections, reading and math, out both out of 800. And let's say on one of your testing dates, you get a 750 in math, but on the other testing date, you get a 700 on math. On the time that you got a 700 in math, you got a higher reading score. You could basically mix and match your math and reading scores to create your largest overall super score. And this is a practice that is followed by a lot of universities. Many accept the super score. There's very few that don't, but I would definitely do some research to make sure that if you are super scoring, that the universities that you're applying to will accept that score. I also wanna to touch on um, the 1550 plus range. There's a very small difference between a 1550 and a 1590. And I always say this because it's pretty much luck and circumstances and your environment that can potentially get you from a 1550 to a 1590. Two students that scored those two scores probably know the same amount of content and they're equally as good at taking the exam, but it's just luck and the types of questions you're given that really determine where you're gonna fall within that range. But when you're on the lower ends of the 500s, that means 1500 to 1550, there's a content gap. So there's definitely more that you need to learn in order to get to that range where it's pretty much just luck. So I took the SAT. So obviously I know more about it. I don't know much about the ACT, but I do know that the SAT range 1550 to 1600 corresponds with the ACT score range of 35 to 36. So AP scores, they're much less cut and dry. They're graded for, from one to five. And many people think that they have to have all fives to get into top 10 or top 20 universities. But I personally don't think that's true. I've seen cases where students with many threes and fours got into equally as great schools. So just to be safe, I would strive to have mostly fives and one to three scores of three or four are not going to hurt your application. But I believe where it will get concerning is if your number of lower scores outnumber your fives because generally your AP score should average to a five. I'll briefly touch on GPA and class rank. Obviously take everything I say with a grain of salt because my experience with GPA and class rank is based on my high school and every high school is very, very different. Your class rank and GPA can differ greatly based on your environment, how rigorous your school is. If you're a junior in high school or even a sophomore, I would encourage you to search up a uniform GPA calculator online to calculate your 4.0 unweighted GPA because every school has a different GPA scale. And if you want to see where you rank in terms of other applicants, then it's really good to look at your unweighted GPA. So most competitive applicants for T10s will be between a 3.8 to a 4.0, 4.0 being the max. So that's also super important to keep in mind. And class rank is also very significant on your college application. I read a statistic once that IVs accept about 90 to 95% of their students from the top 10% of their graduating class. But once the acceptance rates of those schools become lower, then I would start aiming for top 5%. I think that there's a very small difference, again, between top 5%, top 7%, but if you just want to make all the factors work for you and be the best applicant that you can, then I would recommend top 5%. But some schools don't consider your submitted class rank at all. A lot of high schools don't even rank you, so you have nothing to submit to colleges. So for example, the UCs have you submit all of your grades, and then they create a GPA and a class rank for you. So in terms of my extracurriculars and the suggestions I would give for extracurriculars, I would use a lot of variety in your words and make sure you also show by variety and diversity in the types of activities that you're putting on your 10 extracurriculars. If all, if five of your activities are all tutoring, then that doesn't really show the admissions officers that you are open-minded enough in searching for extracurriculars. And you spend your time doing various things that engage different parts of your passions and your mind. And I would also recommend that you keep in mind that you have limited space 
On Common App, I believe you have a 150 character description. So this means that you might have to get rid of the periods, get rid of the full sentences, use semicolons or commas, um, use numbers, use um, abbreviations, just to reduce the amount of space you're spending on one sentence, because you'll be able to include much more content, much more diversity, much more variety, if you do abbreviate and say everything as succinctly as possible. So these are just some more um, suggestions for activities list. I would definitely make sure, this is probably the biggest tip I would give for activity lists, make sure to include the selectivity of the activity or the honor. For example, if you were on a council, if you were a student intern on your city council, and let's say a um, hundred students applied for that position, but you were one of two that actually received it, then you would say I was one of two out of 100 applicants to receive this position. And it really shows admissions officers how hard it was to actually achieve that extracurricular. And I would also really, um, a lot of students include hyperboles or exaggerations in their descriptions, but I would definitely stay away, refrain from doing that because admissions officers have been doing this for decades and they could see um, any, any embellishment that you might put into your application. They do fact check your descriptions and they do fact check the information that's on your college app. So you should definitely be truthful, but also portray yourself to the best of your ability. But next, let's talk about essays. So the personal statement is probably your biggest essay. Um, this is the most important. This is the one that your admissions officers are going to spend the most time reviewing. And the word count is usually 650 words for the common application, but there's other application portals that you can use with different word counts. So in terms of the essay format that you can use for the personal statement, there's basically two predominant ones, the narrative and the montage. The narrative basically takes your admissions officer through a story of your life. It explains a scene or it takes them through your childhood or a certain part of your adolescence. And a montage is basically placing a lot of scenes really rapidly close together to convey a general theme. And most people ask me, what should I write about in my personal statement? And it really differs based on the person. It can range from your identity, your culture, your race, your religion, to academic and career interests. What are you passionate about? What, when did you know that you were gonna pursue a career? There's also meaningful object, objects. For example, if there's a family heirloom that means a lot to you and can tell a person a lot about yourself, then you should definitely include that. So I'll go over a lot of shorter supplemental essays. So each college will generally ask you for four to six smaller essays that range from 100 to 250 words. And a pretty common essay is the why us? Why do you wanna to go to this university? And there's many things you can keep in mind when you're writing this essay, but definitely look at academics, what majors, what institutes, what research projects, what internships can they offer you? What would you love to have academically when you are at that school? And there's also interests and more student life type factors. So clubs, summer programs, student life values. So for example, if a certain university had this really great dance team and you're a dancer and you've been dancing all of high school, then this is a really great outlet for you to talk about your passion for dance and also show the school that you really want to join their dance team and you would be a great addition to their school. The Y major essay is another pretty important supplemental. So in the why major, you're basically saying, if you're majoring in physics, why are you majoring in physics? What were the moments that led you to your interest? Um, what were the different scenes? Maybe you want to show a chronological order from the first time you visited NASA to you as a senior doing a current internship in physics. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the community essay. And recently, this has become a really popular essay prompt. And generally, what the essay will ask you is tell us about you and your community of choice, or how do you contribute to a group of people? And there's a lot of topics that you can basically talk about in this essay. Maybe a place, if there's a group of people that you live or work with, an action, um, for example, if you're in a coding club, or if you're part of activist movements, then you can talk about the change you're doing as part of a group. There's also interest groups that you could discuss, maybe clubs at your school or um, people of similar expertise as you. 
There's also circumstantial groups or circumstantial communities that were brought together by chance or external events. And a pretty large um, community that people often reference is culture. So this means religious, familial, cultural ties that really mean a lot to you and can allow you to convey a lot about yourself. So this is an example of one of my personal essays. So I don't think that this directly aligns with any of the three essay prompts that I've mentioned. Um, this isn't really why major, it's not a why us, it's not a community essay. It's just about me and my academic background. And the prompt was briefly describe an intellectual experience that was important to you. So for this prompt, I talked about my time as a researcher in the Harvard University Heller Group and how I really struggled with failure, encountering mathematical errors and moving past obstacles and roadblocks in my research and how that inevitably made me a better research that was more comfortable with mistakes and self-improvement. So thank you everyone for allowing me to present to you today and to share some of my experiences with college applications. I know some of them might have seemed a little bit daunting, but college applications and the process and the experience are different for every single applicant and everyone ultimately ends up where they were meant to be. And though decisions can be draining and honestly unfavorable at some times, it's, it's pretty evident that you will end up where you're supposed to be and everyone's very happy at the school that they end up going to. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? I see one in chat. Um, if I got a four on the physics one exam and I were to get a five on the physics C exam, should I still retake it? I would say that you should not retake it just because if you got a five on physics C, that automatically means way more than any score you would have gotten on physics one. If even if you got a five on physics one and a five on physics C, your physics one score is almost invalidated because physics C is obviously more rigorous. It's calculus based. The score means more because that's the credit that colleges are looking for. They're looking for calculus based physics. So I would say it's not a problem. And I wouldn't think about retaking any AP exams, even if you got a three or four. I just would not submit that score to colleges because for a lot of schools, you can pick and choose which scores you're actually going to submit. Hi, are you joining, uh, Sorry? Which program are you joining? I'm joining Princeton Astrophysics. I'm studying astrophysics and minoring in mathematics. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. So I want to say congrats for getting into Princeton. Thank you. And so in Common App, isn't there also a place where you submit five awards? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I have... Yeah, I was about to ask what five awards you submitted. Yeah, so um, I think I'm going to have to pull mine up really quick. I did not include it in my presentation. I should have, but I can pull up my common app right now. I, If I were to give advice on the five honors that you submit, I would definitely say to group certain honors together. For example, if you had a lot of science for awards, I would put them all under one honor. Let's say you got first at state, second at regional. Those should not be two separate. They should not take up two separate slots on a common application because you want to fill up those five awards with as many as you can. In terms of the levels of all of these awards, my first three were international distinctions. So I was competing in an international pool to win the award. And my last two were national awards. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, Rashika, did, um, did you give any concern when you were making your decision where to go to, where you ultimately want to go to graduate school? As far as I know that uh, graduate schools normally want you to come from a different school. And did you think about where you ultimately want to go to before you uh, decided your undergraduate? Yeah, that was actually a big factor that I considered. I was really leaning towards Harvard at one point. Harvard had always been my dream school, but I really got to talking to a lot of alumni and students, and they mentioned that if I wanted to go to Harvard for grad school, then I probably shouldn't go for undergrad because that would be um, eight plus years at the same school, and that's never something that I wanted to do. Um, I have a question in chat. What would be the best way to study for AP Physics C? I'm a sophomore taking it this year. I took Physics 1 and Physics 2 before I took Physics C, so I didn't really have to study much for that exam. It was just um, the application of calculus and the concepts I already knew. 
But if I didn't have that foundation, I would have really gone um, into depth into prep books. The Princeton Review uh, Physics C prep book is a really great resource. And practice exams and past FRQs that are now available online are all great resources. I think if you're consistently scoring um, around a five on your practice exams, then you should be good. I would also keep in mind that Physics C is one of the easiest exams to get a five in. Also, the people that are taking Physics C, it's a self-selecting group. That's probably why there's a higher five rates. But you should feel more comfort knowing that around 30% of test takers do get a five in that exam. Does anyone have any more questions? Yeah, just out of curiosity, did you apply to any other programs other than physics? Or physics is the one that you chose for all the universities? So this is a great question. I actually deferred the major that I was applying to based on where I was applying. Sometimes I kept in mind the selectivity of the programs, but generally I applied astrophysics. At Harvard, I applied physics because I had pretty great exposure with their labs in physics because of my research there um, over junior and senior year. But I knew when I was on Princeton astrophysics that it would immediately become my top choice because Princeton is arguably one of the best astro schools in the country. And they're also the number one undergraduate university in the country out of all majors. So um, they were probably my top choice and just getting astrophysics there um, made it even more of a dream school. Okay. Hey, Rishika, I have a general question. Um, I really admire what you have done and you have done so much, you know? So in, my general question is, how did you do it? You know, how, how do you find time? You know, how do you prioritize? A any tips to give to the younger, you know, students over here? Yeah, of course. So I made sure my non-negotiable commitment throughout high school was getting good grades. I consistently was, um, like I said, most of my grades were between a 94 and 100. So under no circumstance that I want my GPA to drop from 4.0. And um, otherwise, I got the SAT, SAT score I wanted at, in the middle of junior year. So once I had those two um, factors out of the way, then I could really focus a lot on my extracurriculars. I would say that the majority of the effort I put into my activities was in junior year and the summer after junior year really just like to compartmentalize the different aspects of my college application. For example, the, the fall of my senior year, I didn't really extend any of my activities. I didn't take on any new research. I just solely focused on college apps and essays. But the summer before my senior year, I solely focused on my research. So just making sure to do one thing at a time and doing that one thing well was definitely a great practice for me. I also maintained a lot of balance in my days, I obviously did a lot of research in high school. And I remember I changed my entire sleeping schedule. So rather than waking up at eight to go to school at nine, I would wake up at five or six and do research in the morning and then go to school at nine. And after school, I would do homework and just make sure my GPA was up. So again, co compartmentalizing my time to certain activities to make sure that I'm not so overwhelmed with everything that I need to do in a day. Oh, wow. Okay. You got up at five or six. So what time do you go to sleep then? I go to sleep pretty early. Um, Whenever I'm waking up at five, I go to sleep at 11. Oh, wow. Okay. Still. Well, again, you have done so much. I feel like, you know, what you did is like two people's time combined can do, you know, so you. <laughs> you're a super woman in my opinion. Thank you. Did you visit all the schools that you applied, uh, Rishika? So oh, that's a great question. I visited, um, I'd been doing college tours the summer before senior year. So in that time, I visited Yale, Harvard, MIT. I would say that when you're choosing a college and you've already gone through all of the logical factors, um, you've already weighed both the academic profiles, you've already weighed the research capacity of both, and you're struggling to pick, I would definitely say visit the campus talk to people, get testimonials from actual students there, and just see where you feel the, the happiest. I know a lot of students that um, were struggling to choose. They've been struggling for weeks, and then they visited, and they immediately knew which campus they would feel most at home with. Um, and that's how I felt when I was at Princeton. It just seemed like such a great environment. So you just stop anyone, I, I mean, just casually chat, you know, and with the students over there and get a feeling, I guess? Yeah. Um, 
it's good to only ask them on preview days, which are the specific admitted students days that colleges set up for incoming mm -hmm. students to come in, talk to people, um, visit classes, sit in on classes, and just get the most exposure they can. I would definitely, uh -huh. um, like Stanford's admitted students weekend is right now, actually. So um, right now, all the current students there are aware that uh, high school seniors are going to be on campus and they're probably going to ask questions. So I would probably um, save those interactions with students until the admitted students day, just so the undergraduate and the graduate students know and they feel comfortable with you asking them. Right, right. Yeah, talking about, you know, uh, writing why school essay, you know, do, if you don't visit a school, uh, what are, do, I guess you find resources online, you know, just mm -hmm. searching the school website or, you know, any, any tips on how to write those if you don't plan to visit the school? Yeah, of course. And I just wanted to say that this is probably going to be the last question I'm going to answer just because I sure. do have to leave at three, but um, I'll answer this question. And if anyone else has anything else to ask me, they can definitely email me. But basically why us essays are pretty tricky for schools you haven't visited, schools you have no connection to, but I would definitely try to be creative. I would look at the syllabus of a certain class. A syllabus is a great way to find out information about a school, that, and a, about a school, about a major, about a class that you typically can't find on the schools, like for example, the University of Michigan website. I would look at the specific websites of research labs. I would maybe talk to a student. Maybe you know someone that went to the University of Michigan, maybe talk to them and find out what's unique about the school. Maybe search up University of Michigan fun facts. Just try to be creative and try not to say the thing that everyone might say. Um, I like the Michigan weather. I love the campus. Um, I think they're really good for engineering. Those are pretty mediocre and bland statements, a college admissions officer needs to really feel that you can see yourself at that school. And that means doing a lot of research for each school. Right. Okay. Very good tips. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. So thank you everyone for letting me present to you today. And again, if you have any more questions, you could definitely email me. Thank you. Once again, congratulations. It's pretty impressive. Thank you so much. Exactly.